Welcome. In this tutorial, I'll try to show you how you can create your own cyborg sound out of any material, including your voice or any other recorded voice. This will be the end result. Welcome. I am Dr. Samuel Hayden. I'm the head of this facility. I think we can work together and resolve this problem in a way that benefits us both. This is a line from the game Doom. I'm not sure if it's from Doom Eternal or Doom 2016. Regardless, let's begin with the tutorial. This tutorial will be two parts tutorial within this video. The first part will be sound designing and the second part will be mixing. Let's first begin with the sound designing rack and we'll keep going from there. The first stage would be using a gate and an EQ8. We're using the gate first of all so we can cut down any sort of silence in between phrases and sentences and we're using the EQ8 just so we can cut down a lot of the low frequencies that are unnecessary. The second stage would be our first rack, which contains a vocoder. In my case, I'm using the vocodex and a dry chain, which only has one equalizer on it. Let's begin with the vocoder first. The vocoder I choose is vocodex by ImageLine. It is a highly versatile and very effective vocoder. In my case here, I'm using the modulator and the carrier as the same source, which are my voice. So as you can see here, I chose both of them to be on channel zero. Also, you can see that the wet knob is not at 100%. It's relatively at the center, a bit upwards. A lot of the vocoder processing is actually more of a trial and error. But let me demonstrate several key concepts here. I'm using the amount of 47 bands and on four order. I'm also playing around with the modulator unison shift and adding five orders, which basically acts like, well, five voices. You have here the pitch shift, which is actually like a formant knob, which controls all of the male characteristics or female characteristics, depends on where you put it. I took it downwards to where male characteristics. The main characteristics of the sound is actually coming from narrowing the bandwidth of each and every bandpass filter from within the vocoder. As you can tell, I chose 47 bands. And I'm playing around with the bandwidth until I get the result I'm after. A few other things I did here was playing around with a pitch shift, which basically acts like a formant knob, which controls of the characteristics of the sound. Either more of the male characteristics or female characteristics. Other things I did was playing around with a unison shift. I added five voices and tweaked it until it sounded correct. A lot of the main idea of the sound would not necessarily be from a defined idea. It was more of a trial and error process, so bear with me. Other things to consider would be playing around with the envelope here from the hold, attack, and release times. And I also added the soundizer level and let some of the high frequencies go through. As I've already mentioned, I played around with a Bane gain multiplier, which acts more or less like the equalizer. I also played with a band distribution spline. Now, I'm not entirely familiar with how it works, but from what I understand, you have all the frequencies here, the entire spectrum. And once you start raising or lowering the edges of this spline, you would actually determine what frequencies will go through. But if I'm mistaken, please let me know. This is it for the vocodex part. Now, as you can probably tell, the vocoder makes a very harsh noise 
the high frequency sounds very, very harsh. In order to tackle that, I'm using the Vocal Street 2 by Solid State Logic, although you don't have to use that particular one. There are two modules which I'm using here. The first module I'm using is Eddie Esser, and as you can see, it works pretty heavily in order to tame those high, harsh frequencies. The second module I'm using is the equalizer, and its basic function is just to shape the sound a little bit. And this concludes our first chain here, the vocoder chain. Our second chain is a dry chain, and I'm only using one equalizer on it. The Pro-Q3 is acting here just as a static and a dynamic EQ. I'm using the dynamic portion of it only on the high frequencies, on problematic frequencies that I found, and the static portion on low frequencies, which I either felt should be boosted and cut it. This concludes our first effects rack. Now let's go to the next one. Our next stage is guitaring. I'm using two modules from guitaring. The first module is Transpose Stretch, which you can find under Components and Pitch. The second module is Reflector, which you can find under Reverb. We'll go through each one of them individually. So the first one is Transpose Stretch, and I'm using it very mildly. I have the dry wet effect only on around 55%, and I'm taking the key and lowering it by minus five. The next module is Reflector. Now I'm using Reflector in a odd manner, I guess. I've loaded in one of my folders, which contains samples which I've downloaded from freesounds.org. These samples are not impulse responses by nature, but I turned them into impulse responses nevertheless. I'm using this module to add a little bit of space, but very mildly. As you can tell, the size is all the way down, and the decay is around 19%. The sample I'm using as an impulse response is the sound of ice cracking, and it sounds like so. After manipulating it inside of Reflector, it sounds completely different. Now let's go to the next stage. Our next stage would be our Pitch, Formant and Dry rack, which consists three chains. We got the Formant, we got the Dry, and we got the Dry. Let's go over the first one. So our first chain would be the Little Alter Boy by Sound Toys. I'm using it on quantize mode. I've unlinked the pitch and the formant, and I've mapped both the formant and the mix knob to each of their own macros. These macros are being modulated using the envelope follower. This envelope follower is taking the signal's amplitude and modulates parameters based on that. The only reason I map the format and the mix to macros is so that I can control how much modulation each of them get from the envelope follower. As you can see here, the format knob is moving according with the envelope follower. It goes from minus 3.1 upwards. The mix knob starts at 100% wet and goes downwards. The next chain is the robot chain. Here I'm using again the little altar boy by Sound Toys. This time I'm using the robot mode and I've unlinked the pitch and the format yet again. As opposed to the previous chain, here I'm actually lowering the pitch by 4 and increasing the format, but keeping them static. And you can hear the result. After the little alter boy, I'm using an equalizer. 
just to shape the overall tone of the sound. Lastly, we have a dry chain. As you can see, I'm blending all three chains by playing around with the volume of each chain. Our final stage is the pipe, ring modulation and dry chains. This rack contains three chains. The first chain is the most complex one. So let's dive into it. On our first chain, we have Epson 5 effects. As you can see here on the patch tab, we have three modules and one effect. First things first, we have our oscillator A set to audio in, and I switched it from mono to stereo signal. Next module is the comb module. Now this module is a little bit tricky, so let me explain. I routed the frequency of the comb into macro one on the absent. Here on the perform tab, you can see all the macros. Here's an important side note. The way that absent work is once you set a frequency, for example, to one of the filters or maybe the comb module, this set frequency is the ceiling frequency, which also means that any modulation that will be applied to this parameter will not exceed the frequency or value that you have chose. In my case here, we have 103 hertz. That means that everything under 103 hertz will be modulatable. Think of it as our bandwidth. Once we start moving the macro, it can only move between the lowest value up to our highest value, which in our case is 103 hertz. You can always change that by either changing the frequency or by going to the assignments on the perform tab of absent. In my case, you can see here on the assignments tab inside the perform tab that I've narrowed the bandwidth of the entire frequencies which are being controlled. Think of it that up here on the depth when it is 99.99% which is the highest value, the macro will modulate our comb frequency from its bottom up to the max. Again, in our case, 103 hertz. By lowering the depth, I've actually narrowed our entire bandwidth. So instead of going all the way down to its lowest value, it goes only 20% down. I'm not sure exactly what frequency would be our lowest value now, but for me, it sounded just right. The main reason I've routed the comb frequencies to macro one is only so I can modulate or automate the parameter. As much as I know, Absinthe won't let you control its parameters the same way you can do in other plugins. So if you'd like to control its parameters, You'd either have to use its entire modulating system, like the envelopes or the LFO, or route it into one of the macros. The way I decided to automate the frequency is by using our friendly envelope firmware from before, which, like I've previously stated, is modulating the parameters based on the amplitude of its input signal. The next module I'm using inside of Epson 5 is the cloud module, although I'm using just a tiny portion of it, only 16%. Now let's talk about the effect. I'm using the pipe effect from within Epson. As much as I can tell, it mimics the behavior of sound inside a certain object or environment. Other devices to consider might be Corpus by Ableton. Yet in our case, I find the pipe effect to be well suited. The wet and dry are set to minus six as in default. 
I'm sending both the master and channel A as the input. I turn on the surround, although its position is default. And given the fact that there are only two channels, the spread isn't really doing anything, and it maintains its original position within the stereo field. In terms of the effect itself, I played around with the length and the feedback. I also play around with the positioning of the left output, the right output, and also the input. You should do it to taste. Next, let's go to the second chain, which is again Epson 5. Again, I'm using the audio in in a stereo mode. But this time, I'm not using the comb or the cloud modules, just the ring modulation module. Lastly, I'm using the pipe effect again, but a bit differently. As you can tell, I placed the positions both of the left and right at the edges and the input at the center. And as I've said before, I also have a dry chain here. And again, I blended the three chains by playing around with the volumes. This concludes our sound design aspect of this project. Now let's go through our mixing stage briefly. First thing I've added was an equalizer. This EQ is completely static. Its main purpose is finding problematic frequencies and either attenuate them or increase them. As you can see, I found a problematic frequency at around 200 Hz, and I felt like we're missing a little bit of spark at around 3000 Hz. Next thing is just a multiband compressor, and I'm using this old timer. The overall use of this compressor is to form a more unified, cohesive sound. Our next device would be another equalizer. I'm using Pro-Q3 as a dynamic equalizer, looking for specific areas of frequencies which I find problematic, either too boomy or boxy or sibilant. And technically, this is just me listening and going through the frequencies until I find something that I want to either cut or boost. As you can see, this equalizer is functioning more of a cutting than boosting. The last plugin on this chain is a limiter, which is being used to push everything forward. Thank you for watching, and I hope you find this useful.